Greetings everyone, I am Dr. J, and welcome to my review of Stardew Valley. This is a game that's been out for quite a while now, but the path that led me to it was unconventional to say the least. Back in December of 2017, I was a freshly minted college graduate, and my brother had recently bought a Nintendo Switch, primarily to use as a travel console for whenever we were visiting family. Being a big Pokemon fan, he decided to buy Pokémon Tournament, since it was the only Pokémon game available at the time. And though he had a decent time with it at home, he quickly found out that playing it on the road gave him motion sickness. This came as a surprise to us, as he was able to watch movies and play with our old Game Boys without issue, but in the former, he wasn't in direct control of the movements, and the games we have for the latter are almost exclusively turn-based strategy games which wouldn't have much of any movement to worry about. Because of this, I went looking for a game that he could play while we were on the road, and at the top of the top sellers list was Stardew Valley. I had a vague memory of the game being discussed on the Co-optional podcast, likely near its release, but since I couldn't remember any details besides a generally positive impression, I decided to go to the most reliable, most dependable source of information which will never steer you wrong, the Steam Reviews. Okay, so first we've got a comment that says it's basically Harvest Moon, another that praises it as a spiritual successor to Harvest Moon, and this one also compares it to Harvest Moon. And then we have this one over here, which really feels like Harvest Moon. Very similar to Just as amazing as I can't believe it's not Harvest Moon. Have you heard of the news about Harvest Moon? Harvest Moon. Harvest Moon. It murdered Harvest Moon, stole Harvest Moon's skin, and befriended Harvest Moon's parents under the guise of consoling them in their hour of grief. Okay, I get it. This game makes you feel like Batman. Great. Good to hear. Happy for you. So, uh, next question. What's Harvest Moon? I mean, you keep talking about it like this is something that I should be familiar with, but, uh... Doesn't really ring any bells. You're gonna make me look this up, aren't you? Ah, fine. Guess I gotta do all the work around here. Oh, it's a farming game. That first released in Japan when I was literally one year old. On a console I never owned. Well, that explains why I haven't heard about it, though it doesn't really explain why it's such a big deal. I mean, Animal Crossing is a thing, but it's not a thing I have any experience or interest in. Still, this does technically count as something with less motion, and therefore something my brother could play in the car. Eh, what's 15 bucks to possibly help a brother out? Fast forward a few months later, and by the time I had moved out, my brother hadn't touched it, but I had spent over 40 hours with it. It wasn't the kind of game that I would have gone out of my way to buy or play, but somehow it was enough to where I would buy it again, twice, when the multiplayer update released, knowing full well that thanks to a bit of leverage, I could drag my brother along for the ride or just have a good time on my own. And since then, it's been one of the games I turn to whenever I want to relax or listen to a podcast. And with this review, I hope to explain why that's the case. The story begins by setting the scene for your character who was given a gift by his or her grandfather to be opened whenever we feel weighed down by the world. Naturally, that day arrives, and when we open the letter, we find a deed to our grandfather's old farm in Stardew Valley, a farm that's fallen into disrepair, but one which offers us a chance to get away from the mundane reality of our former office job. And thus, after a brief introduction to Mayor Lewis and a local carpenter named Robin, we begin by cleaning up the farm, introducing ourselves to the locals, and figuring out what to do with our new life. What makes this setup work so well boils down to two points. The first of these is the freedom to do whatever we want, whenever we want, however we choose to do it. You're routinely given tasks which can give you some direction on what to work on next, but for the most part, the game is a canvas that allows you to do whatever you like within it. If you want to make your farm a titan of industry that focuses on a specific crop and milks it for all it's worth, you can do it. If you want to make your farm the most aesthetically pleasing farm this side of the known universe, you can decorate it to your heart's content, and some of the farms I've seen online are really impressive. If you aren't directly focused on your farm and just want to socialize with everyone in sight, eventually finding someone to marry, then you are free to be a social butterfly to your heart's content. Speaking of those characters, I'll admit that character interaction was a secondary interest for me. But the small story beats scattered throughout the game do a lot to create that small town feel where everyone knows each other and gets along as best as they're able. What's more is that all of them are grounded in some way, with a believable appearance, backstory, personality, and more to where it's worth getting to know them. Add on to that multiple side stories, whether it be figuring out who this mysterious person is, learning more about the other creatures that you encounter, and most importantly of all, your choice to either sign up with the very company you left, or to make the correct choice by restoring the town community center. By virtue of this, there's always something more to discover, something to peel away at or explore further, 
Which ties into my second point, the excellent sense of progression throughout. From a story standpoint, the social tab can help you determine how much time you've spent interacting with others, based on a heart meter that's increased by talking with them, completing tasks at the town's bulletin board, and giving them gifts. As you do so, you'll unlock various events which will trigger based on certain conditions, such as where you enter a place, what time it is, and sometimes even the weather or season. Some of them can be a little obscure, but will make more sense if you take the time to learn more about the characters. For instance, Abigail is a character that's shown to be adventurous, based on her relationship with her parents and how she talks about exploring the mines. The first event isn't necessarily one you would expect, but since her father runs the general store where you purchase seeds from, it's easy enough to encounter the event simply from entering the store. The next one can be found by visiting the mountainous area near Robin's home on a rainy afternoon which can be determined by the fact that she talks about the valley being more interesting when it's raining, and the times you find her playing a flute next to the lake. The next one can be found when visiting the town square at night, which you can partially ascertain from the fact that she sometimes stands in front of a gravestone, a fact you might know about if you're doing a late night errand to the beach. Though it's easy enough to look up a guide to be sure of all of this, the game rewards you for paying attention to small details like this, with enough variation thrown in based on the season, weather, and day of the week to keep you on your toes. As a result, if you've never played before, I suggest you avoid looking things up as much as possible, as the game does a fairly good job at communicating what you need to know, either directly or through visual cues. It'll take a while if you want to see literally everything, but there was something special about my first game on the Switch where it was just me trying to figure out everything and admittedly stumbling quite a bit along the way, but constantly learning more and having a good time while doing it. Which leads us neatly into talking about the gameplay, as courtesy of the excellent progression, there's always something new to do, to a degree where from day to day, I would almost never be doing the exact same thing. Before I go into detail on why, let's talk about all you can do within this game. Naturally, there's the farm itself, which can be as busy or uneventful as you like. You're given a few tools to do pretty much anything you can think of, be it cut down trees, break up rocks, till the soil, or water whatever you plan to ensure it'll actually grow from day to day. Even within this basic system though, you've got a decent amount to consider, such as the type of crops you wish to grow. You'll start out with parsnips, but can grow all sorts of things based on the season. To some extent, you'll want to try them all, as you can use them as cooking ingredients in a kitchen you'll unlock later, but which ones you plant will also affect when you harvest them. Plants like parsnips will only take 4 days to mature, meaning they're quick and simple for a small return on investment, while plants like cauliflower will take much longer to grow, but will also be worth far more when sold to either Pierre or dropped in the collection bin. And then there are plants like strawberries, which you can plant once and continue harvesting for an entire season. And that's before you realize that most plants can only grow during a certain season, meaning you need to consider when you plant everything, as each season only lasts 28 days and anything still living by the end of it is gonna leave a mess behind. Because of this, even something as simple as figuring out which crops to buy, budgeting for the seeds you need to grow them versus the return on investment, and working out how much time and energy you'll need to spend cultivating them end up being interesting to manage and take care of, especially given how intuitive it is. Even as you add more crops and more stuff to worry about, there's always something to make your life easier, such as sprinklers to water nearby crops, as well as late game options that will literally harvest them for you. There's seldom a point where it becomes an overwhelming task, and even when it does, there's nothing stopping you from scaling back a little bit or finding another way to manage things. And that's before considering how you arrange it all, whether to be as efficient as possible or just to look really nice. Since I was primarily focused on progression, I focused both my single player and multiplayer games on being efficient, placing my crops near the water so as to reduce travel time when I was using the watering can, setting up storage barns nearby to make things easier to access, and cordoning off the crops so that my livestock wouldn't get in the way when I tried to harvest any of it. I'll be the first to admit it's not a good looker, but there's a nice sense of ownership when you compare between where you began and where the farm is a year or two later. Luckily for me though, your time won't just be spent worrying about your farm, regardless of whether you focus on crops or livestock. The next activity you'll run into is the fishing minigame, which gives you the opportunity to catch fish to sell for a bit of money or to use in the kitchen as cooking ingredients. The minigame itself is a really interesting one, as instead of just spamming a button over and over, unlike some games, you're trying to keep this bar on the fish whenever you get a bite. It's counterintuitive when you start out, as you have to get a sense for how long to hold the button in order to keep the bar in the same place, but it leads to a surprisingly engaging minigame once you get used to it. It also allows the game to create more variety between the fish, as each type will behave slightly differently, 
giving you a sense for what you're up against without ever seeing it directly. You'll sometimes have these treasure chests show up as well, which can have all sorts of valuable items inside, but require you to spend time away from catching the fish. With an upgraded fishing rod, you can add bait to the line to make it easier to find them, as well as different bobbers to add all kinds of effects, such as making it easier to get treasure chests, making the bar slightly bigger, slowing down the decay rate when the bar isn't on the fish icon, and so on. Finally, once you figure out the momentum for the green bar, you can do all sorts of things with it, such as letting it fall and then timing your button press to where it stays on the ground instead of bouncing back up. It's such a well-designed minigame that I honestly wish that every game that involves fishing would shamelessly rip it off, especially after having to deal with Fire Emblem's pitiful attempt at it for the past few months. Next up is simply exploring the place, which I touched on a little bit with the social interaction, but as you're figuring out what everyone is up to on a regular basis, you'll also find various things on the ground, such as wild flowers that you can pick up, or these little spots that may be hiding various artifacts, which can then be sold or given to the museum for small rewards. And before you ask me how I would know to look at that spot, the TV will tell you as much if you make a habit of watching it on a regular basis. A fact you'll want to do anyway, given that it'll also tell you the next day's weather forecast as well as how lucky you might be for the current day. These offer another reason to explore regularly, especially since pretty much anything you can collect will eventually replenish itself including if you decide to chop down trees in the forest below your farm. Of course, because my brother is crazy, he decided the best way to get extra wood on top of that was to turn our entire pasture into a tree farm, but hey. The game gave him the freedom to do it, and who am I to complain about getting enough wood to make all the kegs in the known universe? And finally, you have the mines, where you can go looking for valuable gemstones, as well as metal ore which can be used to upgrade your tools and build improvements to your farm. However, it's dangerous to go alone, so before going down there, the leader of the Adventurer's Guild tells you to take an old sword in order to defend yourself. The combat aspect is the weakest part of the game, as it's incredibly simplistic and, if you're joining someone else's multiplayer game, there's quite a bit of lag. That being said, given everything else you're doing, it's not something that needs to be complex, and for what you're able to do with the different weapons, there's just enough variety to be interesting while you're also actively looking for minerals and gemstones. That covers pretty much everything you can do within the game, so let's loop back to the second point I made about what makes this game really work. The sense of progression. If any one of these elements were its own game, it might be able to hold your attention to some extent, but would likely become stale after a few hours, to say nothing of the 60 to 80 hours needed to complete two years in-game. However, what makes it work is not just the fact that each individual element has its own charm, but that you're seldom, if ever, doing the same thing from day to day. One day you'll spend all of it setting your farm back up on the first day of a new season. The next you'll take a break from it to go fishing at the river or ocean. The next you can lay down some decorations or rearrange things at the farm before going into the mines. The next you can stop by the community center and work to actively accomplish the tasks required to restore it to its former beauty. The next you can go wandering around, seeing what people are up to when it's a Friday instead of a normal work day. To encourage this, the game has made the activities rely on each other to an extent where even if you try to focus on one part of the game, you'll eventually be checking out the other ones. To explain this, let's walk through what you'll find yourself doing on your first few seasons. After planting a while, you'll notice how much of your energy reserves are used purely on your crops, whether it be tilling the soil, watering them, or clearing out any vegetation that appears at the start of a new season. At some point, you'll realize you can craft sprinklers in order to ensure you have more energy to do other tasks, and can upgrade your tools at the blacksmith shop to make the tasks consume less energy. However, this being a video game, you can't just waltz into the blacksmith without the requisite materials, which means in order to get those upgrades, you'll need to venture into the mines. So you go down a ways, notice how much you're finding down there, and realize just how little inventory space you have at which point you'll spend some time fishing so you can buy the bag upgrade at Pierre's store, as well as chopping down trees so you have more chests to store what you find. So with this increased space, now you have all the room you need to carry out what you find, getting far enough to unlock the lift stacking as your save points, and eventually going far enough down to where you're getting iron instead of the copper you saw in the upper levels. After doing this for a while, you'll notice that the trek over there has been rather time consuming, as you've had to go from your farm across town, past Ramen's cabin, all the way to the mine entrance just so you can start. To be fair, this wouldn't necessarily be a problem if the checkpoints in the mines were set every single level instead of every five, and if the way down weren't randomly concealed behind a rock or a defeated monster. But because both of those are factors, suddenly you're starting to notice how much time you're spending just getting to and from the mines, to where making progress there is effectively an entire day's work. 
So since you're likely passing the community center as you go by, at this point you'll have completed some of the tasks within it, and in the process have unlocked the tasks at the boiler room. Most of them require stuff you find in the mines, but you also notice that if you complete all three bundles, the minecarts start working. That means you can go from the bus stop right outside your farm straight to either the mines or the blacksmith. So now with renewed vigor, you chug some coffee to help you run faster, because what else would coffee do in a game like this? Dash down in there, reach the point where you find gold, and complete the bundle so you can go to and from the mines in far less time. So now that you've done that, you've got the materials you need to set up more sprinklers and improve your tools. With all of these steps in between, just because you wanted to spend less time and energy on your farm. And that's really the beauty of this game. As someone who loves min-maxing from all the RPGs I play, it's a game that has that just one more level feel while also being a much more relaxed environment. I'll admit that after the second year it becomes less interesting, as you end up seeing most of what the game has to offer and can end up in a holding pattern. But if a game can hold my attention for over 70 hours and only after that point start to feel repetitive, I think it's fair to say that I got my money's worth. And honestly, seeing how creative people can be with their farms, I think the main reason I started losing interest was less a result of the game, and more lack of creativity on my own accord. There are so many parts of the farm that I could make better use of if I would just take the time to stop and think about what I want to put where, especially if I decided to focus on aesthetics instead of practicality. And that's all before I mention just how gorgeous it is. The sprite art is fantastic creating effective contrasts between the different locations and seasons, all while being pleasant to look at. And when it comes to the music, it is the perfect soundtrack for this kind of game. Most of the buildings have their own theme to help distinguish what would otherwise be similar interiors, but can admittedly be repetitive and jarring given how often you only hear the first few seconds and then run off to take care of something else. When it comes to the overworld music though, when you're just exploring the place or taking care of business at the start of a new day, the soundtrack is pure bliss. It's hard for me to quantify why exactly I like it so much, because when I take a step back and listen to it, the songs rely on simple melodies without much flair or fanfare. And yet, I think that's why I like it so much, because it's the perfect choice for a relaxed game like this. It's not there to distract you or draw attention to itself, it's there to set the mood and create the relaxed atmosphere the rest of the game is aiming for, which it does spectacularly. To make the game even more appealing, it's still being updated to this day, with the biggest change being the addition of multiplayer in the middle of 2018. With it, you can now set up a world and invite your friends to play on the same farm. When you're setting up the game, you have a choice on how many cabins you want to start with, allowing you to have up to three people join your world. From there, you can either pass off access codes in order to join a game, or if you're using Steam, you can also leverage the Steam friends list to jump into a multiplayer game that way as well. Initially, the farm and everything in it was a joint effort, and it still is if you so choose. Each of you would have your own tools and house, but all golden resources would be shared. This then meant it was less a competition to see who could do well, but instead a cooperative effort as you take care of different tasks. However, while this might sound amazing on the surface, allowing you to progress faster than you might have otherwise, there is a drawback to playing online. Whenever there's only one person in a game, the in-game clock will stop whenever you open a menu, start the fishing minigame, view a cutscene, alt tab out, and so on and so forth. However, in order to prevent the game from being put on hold every time that happens, the in-game clock only stops in multiplayer on shared cutscenes, meaning the game progresses much faster than you would otherwise expect. Because of this, not only do you have the fun of trying to coordinate with another player or three on what exactly you want to do, you also have less time than you might be used to in order to do it, creating a very different feel from single player. Anyone in the game can pause and unpause whenever he wishes, which can offer you that time or allow someone to step away for a moment, but you aren't able to take any action during said pause. Despite this drawback, the multiplayer ended up being surprisingly fun, as despite having seen everything the game had to offer at that point, I had a great time showing my brother the ropes and figuring out what we wanted the farm to look like. We've seldom focused on the same tasks, at least not at the same time, but it's been a fun place where we can just forget about whatever's going on in our personal lives and just find ways to improve our farm. This alone was a major improvement that helped the game's longevity, but then you get into version 1.4, an update that was released around the end of 2019, and added a ton of little things that make it worth going back to your old save files. For one thing, it became possible to have separate gold reserves in multiplayer, 
and included a map that allows you to effectively give each player their own little corner to carve out as their own. That then means while you may still be fighting over who gets to do what tasks in a given day, at least you don't have to worry about freaking your fellow farmer out when you go to Pierre's and buy literally every seed in existence. It also added a ton of quality of life improvements, such as this button over here which will automatically add items from your inventory to a chest if that item is present there as well. This means instead of hunting through your inventory and shift clicking every time you want to move something, you can instead hit that button and watch everything sort itself out, which has been a godsend for my multiplayer game. It also added new ways to progress by adding an extra heart event for any character you're married to, added another bundle which you can complete after finishing the community center, and added more ways that you can trade your resources once you reach the late game. And even with that, I'm certain there's something I've missed, but that is, again, part of the fun when it comes to this game. Exploring it at your leisure and figuring out what you can do within it. So on the whole, this wasn't a game that I would have sought out without extenuating circumstances, but I'm glad that I did so anyway. It's not a high-octane action game or a storied adventure filled with danger and excitement. It's just a relaxing escape from the world as you take your own little stretch of land and make of it whatever you see fit. Maybe alone, or maybe with a friend or three. And honestly, sometimes a game like this is exactly what you need. And if it sounds like something you'd enjoy as well, you can find it on PC, every major console, and even mobile devices. I can't speak to how good the mobile version is, but if it's even half as good as the PC and Switch versions, I think it'll be worth your while. For now, that's all I have for this video. Thank you all for watching. Please like and share this if you find it deserving, and subscribe to this channel for more reviews as well as other content posted on a not-so-regular basis. Also, since there are often large gaps between when I upload, feel free to hit the notifications bell, as that will let you know whenever I can dedicate time to finish your review. After having relaxed with this game for a while, I think my next one will either be to look at the most recent DLC for Fire Emblem Three Houses, or to toss a coin to a game in my backlog. I still need to go through that game in hard mode just to see what kind of pain it can inflict on me, meaning I might need to toss two coins just to be safe, but I'm looking forward to talking more about that later. In hindsight, it might have been better to time this video where it didn't coincide with the new release for Animal Crossing, but since my more popular videos have revolved around PC gaming, I figure some of you who haven't bought a Switch might want something to distract you from all of their silliness. Of course, now that I've mentioned Animal Crossing, my friends will inevitably pester me about playing it, even though I've never played one of those games and as of now have no interest in the newest entry, but I'll burn that bridge when I come to it. Regardless, thank you once again for watching, let me know what you think in the comments below, and I'll see you all later.